my overweb and mine. Um, so we finally finished chapter three. Don't let the chapter numbers bother you because I've told y'all I've got this online textbook that none of y'all have ever looked at. Right, it's the online open resources textbook that I'm going with. But I started teaching things in the order that I've taught things in the past, but the order that they've got stuff in the book. Oh well. So we go from chapter three to chapter twenty-two. Bit of a hop, but that's okay. Because technically, what we did in chapter two pulled from like three different chapters. So it doesn't matter because y'all are reading the book anyway, right? Reading that in front of y'all be reading while you're driving down the road. Instead of texting, we're reading. So, um, and I can't pound on a wall because there's a coffee and I just throw this useful. And then we just had this stupid thing. It's, uh, okay. Sorry, people. And we're back. Hopefully, we're working for it here. So, um, the economy as a whole can be divided into two parts. The private sector, that is, that's the stuff that's done by a private individual, you and me. That is what we do with our money, and what we do with our money is stuff that belongs to us. And so, that's where you think like private property and that kind of stuff. You're not, you're not going to go buy your house and open it up and let anybody come in there and do whatever they want to your house at any time. You're not going to buy your own car and just park it out in the parking lot, leave the keys in and let people drive it and all no. Right. So you have stuff that we do as private individuals, and then you have stuff that is done by the public for the public. Who's that? What's that going to be? Government. The government. Because the government is what? Here in the United States. We the people, yeah. It's for the people, it's we the people. We all combine, I've maybe talked about this somewhere. We all combine resources to take care of things that we can't do on our own. Yeah, we don't have to, we got it, maybe I thought about it. We don't have enough time in the day to teach our kids to protect our homes, to build houses. So we're pulling our resources together and it's all for the public good because it's all your money and my money going together to pay the teachers so your kids, my kids can all go to school and get taught. It's your money and my money that's going together to build this highway, so it's your money and so I mean you and I can both drive on the road and get in here like I did yesterday morning. I'm working for like, like I was going too fast. Anyway, I have to fix the car and keep our rings. Uh, then Luke showed up and everything went sideways. <laughs> Hi Luke! <laughs> anyway, um, so the private sector, that's gonna be all the non-government parts of the economy. That's you and us, is our, you and I, our households. And that's going to be the businesses that you and I own and run. And then that's going to be any activity done by farm people in our economy. Yeah, farm, you know, people coming out from, coming on vacation from somewhere else, coming here, visiting us and leaving. Or somebody from a farm business ordering, buying stuff from an American business. Well, that's the American business selling it to a farm business, so that still is going to be private sector. Public sector is going to be the stuff done by the government. I say I'm for the part. <laughs> Should have heard what they were saying, but I tried to defend you, but I really couldn't. I had to agree with them on most things. And, and unfortunately, I wasn't recording, so anyway. So, um, so, that's good. Excuse me. Perfect. Oh, perfect again. Um, you've heard of a free market, market concept. Yeah. That, that's what we have in the United States. We have the, if you want to start a business, you can start a business. If you want to shut that business down, you can shut that business down. If you want to do whatever you do. But generally, for a market economy, the consumer is what drives things. Here in America, remember, market. What was market? That definition? No, uh, the supply. Yeah, where suppliers and demanders meet. Well, you know, the suppliers ain't going to supply it if there's no demand for it, right? So we're kind of, we sort of drive things. If, if only a couple people want it, they're going to make a little bit of it. If a bunch of people want it, somebody's going to make a bunch of it. So it really, a lot of things in our economy, it really boils down to, bless you, it really boils down to us 
as households, us as individuals, us as businesses to what we're buying. Where in a centrally planned economy, something going into more socialism or communism or something like that, the government is doing a central planning and they're figuring out what gets better. The government's going to make a decision, we're going to build houses in that town, whether they need it or not. Where for us, you know, here in America, the decision on building a house is based on, do we have somebody that's going to buy it? Right. Uh, just, I don't ever watch a show, but go sometime before, go on YouTube for a couple of minutes, look 60 minutes, I, I, I guess you can search like 60 minutes, and then empty Chinese city. They did an article about a year and a half ago, whatever, the Chinese government, they built this entire city thinking that they were going to do something, people were going to come in, whatever. Nothing. It's like a, it's a modern city ghost town. Just because the government decided, well, we want a city there because we want such and such to have them. And they were sort of going, if you build it, they'll come, and well, they didn't come. Oh, well. Um, well, you build a couple buildings first. So yeah, you'll build the whole thing. I mean, I'm talking mean, overpasses, highway, you just everything. I mean, it's like uh, imagine walking, driving into Atlanta after either A, the rapture, B, the zombie apocalypse, B, C, the aliens come and abduct us all. That's what it looks like, except there's no cars scattered around right in the middle of the street. I mean, it's empty city. And just empty buildings. Huh? Empty buildings, too, probably. Yes, I mean, all the buildings, the buildings, I mean, skyscrapers, all flat. Empty. Storage, waiting for shells to be put in and stuff. Nothing. Well, and then most people work like farms or bathrooms. Well, yeah, and, and that was the thing they were thinking and hoping that people were going to move into this city, to these new buildings, housing's going to be cheap and we're going to do it, and they were setting it up in that location. I can't remember why, because I did not actually watch the article. I saw like two minutes of it. Channel, that's why I knew they did it. But they built it for some reason. The government said we well, want it to be here for whatever reason, and they built an entire thing. So that's to the extreme. He doesn't go to that extreme, but for whatever reason it did. For whatever reason it went that far. <laughs> but old school, if you go back to Russia, back to the Soviet Union back in the day, but they're sitting there deciding how much land people are going to have and what they're going to produce and what they're going to be allowed to produce and where they're going to work and if you work enough time and you're on a job enough time then you may end up I'm going to use this phrase, earning enough credits to where okay we'll actually allow you to get a car and we'll actually allow you to you know what just that kind of thing it's kind of rationing as far as what you can go and get to the grocery store and that kind of stuff and all that kind of stuff because government's deciding this is what's going to be grown, this is what's going to be built, this is what's going to happen. But we don't have that here in the United States. Mm -hmm. But when the dust settles, um, we're going to have a, a picture on the next page. Um, on the next slide, we're going to visit. When the dust settles, now we've already hinted at this, there are four players in the economy. And there are only four players in the economy. It's going to be us, that you and I, our households, private individual. It's going to be the businesses that we own. It's going to be the government that is us. And then foreigners, that's everybody not here in the United States. All right. So is there anybody left? It's us, our businesses, and our government. That's all of us Americans. All of us Americans and our businesses and government. That's all of us Americans. And the foreigners are all of the non-Americans. Right? Aliens? 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 They are be foreigners. Yeah. They just don't have to be from another planet instead of the other side of this planet. Yeah. It's all... You, there's nobody left. So these are the four players in an economy. And we all interact with one another. And that's what makes makes the world go around, makes the economy go around in a circular flow. So ultimately a market is wherever buyers and sellers meet. We have break this down just separately in your mind. Just think of the relationship between households and businesses. Okay. Let's just think household and business. We have two different relationships. 
What relationship is resources? We, as individuals, provide the businesses with the land they're going to use. We provide them the labor they're going to use. We provide them the tools and equipment and otherwise that they're going to use. We provide them the knowledge they're going to use, right? Because we're either business owners or we're business employees or something like that. So we give them our time, we give them our labor, we give them our knowledge, and they give us money in return, either wages or rent or that kind of thing. We lend them money, and they pay us back with interest. Right. So that's the relationship there. What's our other relationship with businesses? Yeah, we buy stuff. Oh, okay. We buy stuff that they make. So we have the product markets where we're taking our money and we're giving it to business. So first one, the businesses are giving us money because we're doing something. And now this market, we're giving the businesses something because they're doing something, giving us our voice, our electronics, energy, and electricity, and whatever they're doing. Don't go there yet. But the resources, that's the land, labor, capital, knowledge that we talked about before, right? So our exchange of that. Then the product market is where we're getting the goods and services, the stuff that we're buying. So drop. Oh, she won't pay like, no, no, take it back. <laughs> take it back. I mean, she said, I think mean, her lips started to curl a little bit, and her head started to shake back and forth, and her eyes they sort of got that almost like not quite the good puppy look about it. It's, just like, it's not just. I just got to go to bed and <laughs> and I was just talking good about y'all. I need to go back with an answer. Most of the people in that you got last are right. Okay, take uh, do some paper for those of y'all that are copying notes, get a new sheet of paper, you know, book, draw it like this. You can do the whole page. So this is over here, this household's over here. Give yourself plenty of room to write. Okay, so this is a visual representation of what we just talked about. Businesses and households. We do an exchange with our resources, we do an exchange with our products. I kind of already talked a little bit through it already. So let's talk about product market. What, what do we do? We give them money. They give us what are called skills, goods and services. You know, cell phones, sodas, chicken soup, bars, fans. So this is what households are doing in terms of products. We're giving them money, we're getting stuff in return. Businesses are doing what for the product market? They are providing the stuff. And why are they making the cars, the chainsaws, the TVs, and the cell phone stuff? They say, well, money. I could go into detail, but I'm not going to, you know, talking about things like, you know, the, all the different ways, you know, the prices you sell and so forth and all that kind of stuff. The market relate the resource market relationship we have, we kind of already talked about that. We provide them labor that they use. And what do we get in return? Our paycheck, right? And what do they got to do? They got to pay money to get our labor. We provide them with land. They give us rent in return. We provide them our knowledge because you just don't go to work. 
we have our knowledge, our experience, we bring that to the table there. So land, labor, knowledge, capital, tools, equipment. So we get money, don't, don't worry about it, but we get money in terms of wages, rent, interest. Don't write that down because we're gonna see that and ignore that in about 20 more minutes. Okay, we're gonna come back to that and see it and ignore it. Actually, it's gonna be more like 40. But this is basically the same exchange there. You don't notice anything yet. This is technically, if you see, if I drew this correctly, this would be a circle instead of sort of straight lines, but okay. Circular flow. What happens with flow? Things keep moving. Let's look at the money. What's happening? Money goes to here, goes to here, goes to here, goes here. The money is cycling around. What are we really doing? What are we really doing? Why are we working? Wrong. Do not work and give money. Do you get your paycheck on a Friday afternoon, go to the bank and say, I like it all in one piece, and take that pile of cash and <coughs> spread it out on you, match it, start swinging through it, singing, wearing the money like Daffy does. It. And start wallpapering walls in your house with it, start stacking them up on the table rollers. No. We work to get what you need. We work to get you stuff. The money is just a detail, how we make it happen. The money is just a tool that we use to, because, Otherwise, we'd be going back to that barter system, like whatever, Ashley and Barry with the plumbing and taxes, that kind of stuff, and well, what do we do? You know, I'm going to go and work for a corn seed company, and they're going to pay me, and what corn seeds, what crap am I going to do with nothing but corn seeds, right? We need so money just greases the wheels, makes it easier for us to get the things that we need compared to what other people need, and the reason why we work is to get stuff. The money's just the detail. Okay? That's the exchange that's really going on here. We're giving them our time and our energy in order to get stuff. Haley is young, living at home with her parents, driving the car that they gave her when she graduated high school. You go, girl. And they're taking care of her. They're giving her some money to pay for her gasoline. She doesn't have to work while she's eating. Not her. <laughs> she's too good to drink, so I dropped that. <laughs> no. uh, does she need to work? No. So does she have a job? No. <laughs> because you don't. You, you got fired today. You didn't get the text again? <laughs> yeah. I was talking to your boss. You got labeled. No. Uh, just think about those kids in high school. A lot of them didn't work. Why? Because they didn't need to. And the more you need to, the more work you're going to do. Uh, so y'all are young and bulletproof and that kind of stuff. So y'all just, some of y'all, y'all just work part time just to get enough money to work. So you can have gas and cars. So you go hang out with your friends on the weekends. So you can have enough money to buy whatever beverage of choice to drink during the weekends. But then there's a couple of you. Coca Cola. That's Coke. Coke. Sundrop. <laughs> Milk. Yes. What? Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Jenny, I'm driven. a couple of us a little start, right? We've had kids. Right. They changed the thing. How much do you feel free? How much do you work in a week? Um, a crap ton? How much do I work? Yeah. I work three days, probably like 16, 17 hours. That's what I'm talking about. Y'all have seen her coming in here on Tuesday before, kind of like a zombie because she, what, you only got like two hours of sleep or mm -hmm. something like that kind of thing? She's working because she needs more stuff. Uh, you think Bill Gates is working re real hard? Yeah. He ain't knocking in a 40 hour week because he don't need the money. Right. 40, 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah, 40 minute week. Yeah. That, I can handle that. I just, <laughs> every once in a while, about once a year when we're driving down the highway, my wife and I start talking about what would we do if we won $273 million in the lottery? Just work it. I used to lie to myself and say, yeah, I keep working, but I wouldn't be overlooked. No. I mean, I like y'all and all, but I'm just saying. <laughs> the only way I would keep teaching here is if I like got a helicopter and hired somebody to be flying me back and forth. Dang, no. I'm just like, that's not gonna work. I'm just saying. 
That's not going to make the other teachers do it. I don't know. That was <laughs> Maybe there's a couple of them that I, but most of them don't need a helicopter because they only live a few miles away. But, yeah, but there's a couple of them that have had my back that I would like to. I, I think there are a couple of them. Maybe I donate a little bit of money to the College Foundation or something like that for these college trips. Let's go yell at them now. Yes. <laughs> so, this is generally the relationship between businesses. Households. Are we shocked by any of them? Surprise me. But remember, I think it was y'all I was telling y'all a couple weeks ago. I think probably when we were talking opportunity costs. Think about your decision. When Lestar bought that doctor and that Mountain Dew that she's drinking now, what did it cost her? Money. What did it really cost her? Time. Because it took an extra 15 minutes worth of time on a job away from her kids in order to get the money to buy them and do Well, hopefully it's only like 45 minutes, only 30 minutes. You can get paid out a little and hold on this So, but that's kind of the thing to think about. When you're buying a car, you need to think about how many hours of your life you have to give up in order to be driving that new car. How many hours of your life are you going to have to be giving up in order to have that new iPhone X, S, Max? That the camera on the XS is still worse than the Pixel 2 camera, and the Pixel 3 is coming out in two weeks, but I'm just saying. Uh, how can I get rid of this? That didn't work. <laughs> okay. So, we have all this going on. Now we complicate things because we get the government involved. The government complicates things, right? So, Okay, I'm going to erase some of what I have so I have room to write more. Okay, so the government, what is the relationship that we as households, you and I as individuals, have to the government? Taxes. Okay, we give them taxes. What do we get for it? Uh, security tax returns. Okay, tax returns, okay, but we get services like um, security. Yeah. Services, that's the word. Security is a service. Education is a service. The highways are a service. The hospitals, the fire department, and the police department, those are services that we're getting. The government doesn't give you goods. When was the last time the government sent a box or something to your house? Never. No. Technically, I mean, ideally, instead of using stuff when I'm talking about that household and business, I would be using goods and services, but I just bumped it down. But for government specifically, it's services. They did send a box and they scared it over. Yes. But is that the only relationship? Yeah. yeah. There's a second one. What would it be? Y'all said no, so we just wait. Court, like, well, Court that's service. Law. That's legal service. Law. Law. Laws. That's legal Law. service. Yep. Um, no, military. That's a service. Let's go in the other direction. There are people that get money from the government. I'm not meaning welfare benefits because that's kind of a service. No, it's just people like me. That oh, that works. It is a government employee. The police officer are government employees. The fire department government employees, the soldiers, government employees, they're giving their labor, they're giving their land, they're running their land, the government, whatever. Which technically, in like coming full circle, we're paying the government. You would have services like that anyway. Yeah, for yeah. us. <laughs> we're paying the government for you to have a job. <laughs> yes. So I yes. your job. So, yeah. I, am the, I am the conduit that the government is using to provide you the service of the education. Yes. So, in the long run, we're all your boss. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Assuming you actually pay taxes, probably two thirds of you got all your money back in a form of protection fund. No, 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 you did. What they take out of each check? They take out ta federal tax. They take out Social Security. Not a tax. They take out unemployment. Not a tax. It's that tax part of it. It's only about forty percent of what it is they take out of your paycheck. You add that number up, and if you're making less than like fifteen thousand dollars a year, you're getting all of that back. It depends. I, don't, I mean, I just, I'm not sure where to cut off the S, Tiffany. I don't have any text about your calendar. But so, just anyway, so a lot of you don't pay tax. Your parents are very good. Y'all, you ain't the boss. You ain't the boss of me. That's my wife. Well, <laughs> Dr. Dalton thinks she might be. Dr. Roberts, she said to all one of you know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> he might sort of be, but no, a white. Anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my wife, I've told you, that song guys surrender all of ain't just by Jesus. It's about my wife, too. So there we go. So, <laughs> so this relationship to household family business. Some households get money out of the government. All households give money to the government. All households get some services from the government, but some of us households get labor by the government. So you have that relationship there. Businesses have a relationship with the government, and what would those be? Doesn't it um, fund their business? We'll yeah, start sorry, with that. Businesses pay the government taxes yeah. in return for services, just like us. The military is protecting us, it's protecting our the businesses. The police is protecting us and protecting the businesses. The uh, no, no. the correct apologies is you're taking bribes from us or taking bribes. From us. <laughs> so, same, so they're getting services, but then there's a second relationship. A lot of those tax dollars, all that money y'all paying taxes and then talking to me about my paycheck. Right. The government. A good chunk of what it is that the government is spending money on is to get stuff for businesses. The government didn't build this computer, Dell did. The government bought it from Dell. The government didn't build that Ford truck that the building scrams people ride around in. Ford did. Right? The government is buying good, buying stuff, goods and services from this. They wear smart controls, smart boards, fans, chainsaws, whatever it is that the business is using. Paying, uh, the paying for the people that are paying for, well, PDOT has their own road paving equipment. That would be going here, the employees that they hire they don't, that are using the paving equipment or you know, here. All part of the thing. That's the exchange. There. And I apparently tapped the board and I gave away piece number four. The fourth player, foreigners, where do they plug in? They, they plug in to businesses. That's smart because so like every bodega is, is owned by foreign. Well, I don't say everyone, but a lot of ones that I go into. Yes, but those foreigners, if people of particular business. Well, I start to say different. Uh, uh, I don't know the politically correctly. And this point is American. What exactly is American? So it's not Americans. Well, you know, we all are like, but the, uh, but even people owning the bodegas, whatever, most of you know, they they may be American citizens, or whatever. So they still are American. So this could be the people who live in China, that live in India, that live in Haiti, that live in Greece, that live in Brazil, that live in France, Italy. That makes sense. What ends up happening is you and I shop at American businesses. The people in France shop at a French business. But what ends up happening is French business is going to buy stuff from the American business. If anybody in France, for whatever reason, decides they want to drink a Budweiser, well, they ain't going to get an airplane and fly over here to the United States and buy a Bud and fly back. No. They're going to go to some store or grocery store or somebody like that. They just contacted Anheuser Bush and said, we want to sell a bunch of your beer. We're going to buy a bunch of your beer and then sell it to our people. 
So the relationship is business to business. It ain't government to government. And that's the thing. People get mad. The Chinese government, we blame China for the trade deficit. It ain't China. It's Chinese businesses are buying more from, buying less from American businesses, and American businesses are buying from Chinese businesses. It's business to business. It ain't the government. The government sets the rules that allows the exchange to happen in the first place, just like the government sets the rules that allows you to drive up and down the highway. Right? But it ain't the government's fault that American businesses are buying more from Chinese businesses and Chinese businesses are buying from us. But that foreign relationship, we're not buying from a foreign company unless, I don't know, you go to Amazon.co.uk and then you're buying from Amazon in England or something like or Amazon.ca and you're buying from Amazon in Canada. But you still, we're, we don't, we're not dealing with foreign businesses. We're dealing with importers like I said, you can you, 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 whatever, or Heineken beer or whatever, just says they're bought and imported by such and such a company. Your Dalsekis or Corona, y'all don't drink beer, but anyway, that's all imported by somebody else. That's what you have. You don't buy a car from Toyota. You buy it from the Toyota dealership in town that bought it from Toyota Motor Company of North America that bought it from Toyota Motor Company of Japan. Business is exchange. So the exchanges go both ways. We give them money to get their stuff. They give us money to get our stuff. Let me backtrack because of the money. The government is a nonprofit organization, but they get the spend. So all the money coming into the government, all the money coming into the government goes out of the government. Even the money they don't have. Even the money they don't. So this flow, households to businesses. We're working to get stuff, right? The business make profit. What do they do with the profit? <coughs> they either use it to buy more stuff, more tools, and equipment, so they can grow their business, or they take that profit and do what? Give it back to the owners, right? So it's a complete flow. If there were no, if this farm piece wasn't there at all, it would be a complete zero sum game flow, all the money going into government comes out of government, all the money going into business goes out of business, all the money going into households goes out of, boom. But here, and so ideally, over here in this foreign trade exchange thing, ideally, if we had <laughs> stuff, money, money, stuff, ideally, if trade was fair, we buy a billion dollars worth of stuff, their stuff, they buy a billion dollars worth of our stuff, what's happening? The billions cancel out. And what is happening? We get stuff for stuff. That's why we call trade. Because if it's fair, if it's even, we get we can send y'all stuff, y'all send us stuff, no matter which businesses are we sending from, which businesses are we getting receiving from. That's just detail, but for overall, for country wide, it's a stuff for stuff. That's why we call it trade. Most of uh, yeah. but, but what's ended up happening? It looks like oh, it. what's the point of that? Well, we get the world peace and the better variety and more efficient use of resources and all that kind of stuff, but I mean, if I'm giving you stuff. Well, you're going to give me stuff that I want, I'm going to give you stuff that you want. But what's ended up happening here? Let's see if I correct this correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, but what is happening here in our international trade here is we're sending a lot of money to them, and we're getting a little bit of stuff. They're sending a little bit of money to us. I'm doing this. Let's try that. We're sending them a lot of money, getting a lot of stuff. What's happening? They're sending us only a little bit of money, only getting a little bit of our stuff. So what's happening? The money they're giving, we're giving them is more than the money that they're giving us. 
So we have, this is supposed to be a complete cycle here. Well, there's this leak. The bathtub has a hole in it. Hemorrhage, well, leak, crack. Yeah. Which, when we come back to chapter, I don't even know what the chapter number is now. Well, 19, maybe we'll circle back to this at the end of the semester. It is money leaking out. And there's jobs leaking out because they're making more stuff because of trade than we're making because of trade. So we slowly are having money leaving our country and we're slowly losing jobs out of our country because of trade. Why do we care? Well, we get a whole lot of neat and interesting things that we can buy at Walmart that we wouldn't have to buy from Walmart otherwise. It would. But guess what? More money is leaving. We've talked about it before. If you have less of something, how valuable is each remaining item you have left? Probably a lot more valuable. So what happens if the money is going away? There's less money. So that makes it harder for businesses. That, so that makes that money more valuable. It makes it harder for businesses to give it to us. So this could end up leading to some profound impacts as far as prices here in America, employment here in America, that kind of thing here in America. In the long run. In the short run, we can handle hiccup for a little while and hopefully you can. That's the dream is five, ten years from now, that's going to get smaller, that's going to get bigger, or they're equal. Or that's going to get bigger and that's going to get even bigger still, until they're equal. That's the dream. We just had this adjustment process that came up. Shouldn't that be the left side of the money that we're giving to the poor? This is money we're giving right here. That's money for the outgoing era. So we're giving a lot of money for the stuff. That's just big money leaving, big stuff coming in. Um, that's okay. So, y'all with me on this? Okay. But here's the horrifying thing. It's going to be a semi blank one of these on the test. You're going to have to fill in kind of blanks. <laughs> but I'm not going to be for people and have you be sitting there talking about it. interest payments, wages, and all that. I'll have the lines drawn. The picture will be drawn. You just got to fill in some of the boxes. The line with the business there. resources have or just maybe five or six. You'll have to. Uh, some of those boxes I'll have filled in, some of them you'll have to fill in. Some of the errors I will have labeled, some of the errors you'll have to label. But guess what? Half of them will be easy because yeah, right. if you got money going out, well then, okay, you got money got to come all the way the rest of the way here. So if you got money there, well, money's got to go around, money's got to go around, make sure you've got money going around everywhere, right? So just, and then you just got to sort of think through those other ways. Well, what breaks the this? Or break it. Please say it's um, circulating flow. It. What breaks? Dying. <laughs> what deletes? What what breaks the circular flow? Microsoft. <laughs> now the war can break it, but it's it's not gonna necessarily be. Revolution will break it. War, not necessarily. Civil war, that's kind of in the revolution category. That's going to break it. But if we go to war, what's going to end up happening? The government's going to say, hey, we need a whole lot of y'all's money because we got to be buying a whole bunch of tanks and guns and airplanes and bullets and that kind of thing. Bizarrely enough, a war that's taking place outside your country's boundaries is good for the economy. Because the government's buying more bullets than they were before, the government's buying more airplanes than they were before. So that means Boeing is making more airplanes than they were before. That means Federal is making more bullets than they were before, which is creating jobs. And the more of us that are working, the harder it is for other businesses to find workers. So they've got to raise their wages in order to hire to. War is good for the economy as long as the war isn't happening in the borders of your country. If they're blowing up your buildings, that's a problem. 
the United States did very well World War One, World War Two, because we were supplying, we were fighting a war, employing our people, and we were building a bunch of guns and airplanes and tanks and stuff that Russia and England were using to fight as well. The whole Land Lease Act, y'all history books, you know, people are, the Land Lease Act is like, well, we're going to build some boats and well, we'll just sort of lend them to you, lease them for you. If they survive in the war or what, at the end of the war, you can like give them back to us and we'll work out whatever kind of random kind of thing and we'll just sweat it. Would you build a boat to give them to you? It better let y'all fight war and have your men die than our men die, right? Which would you rather do? Have your kids die or you pay money to have somebody else's kids die? <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of part of it. But so, war revolution it would tear this up. But what would happen here is more of our money is going to businesses in the case of a war. And so, the businesses are providing more services to the government. So, what does that leave? Well, there's less stuff coming out here for us to buy. That gets into the rationing and that kind of stuff because they're making all the food and it's going to the soldiers and ain't none for us. They're taking all the rubber, they're making all the tires, it's going to the jeeps and there's none out there for us kind of thing. So you end up, a lot of times you'll end up with an interesting accumulation of wealth because like I've got all this money and I can't spend it on anything because there's nothing on the store shelf. But then consequently, if there's nothing on the store shelf, so those few things that are there, what do you think is going to happen to the price? Go up. Way up. So it's going to really shift the balance. The metaphor that popped into my mind first that asked that question. Picture, if you will, I'm holding a balloon. It's round, right? What happens if I squeeze one end of it? The other end's going to get bigger. But it didn't pop, hopefully, because I don't have anything to go. It's going to change the shape of it. It's going to look entirely different. It's going to be straight, straining and stressing there. It's going to be different, but it's still going to be there. Revolution, pop. Um, alien invasion, pop. That's only if the aliens decide to invade. You were an alien when you got there with data this particular capture in the stream. Uh, just keep that in mind. Self destruction. Come on, I'll come back by you. <laughs> Anyway, so now I didn't go back to the I'm just coming full circle. We saw this a minute ago, 20 minutes ago. But this just check a few boxes here. You already saw that those resource inputs in that resource market are land, labor, capital, and knowledge that we're getting money for. We measure productivity in how much work are we getting out of our land, out of our labor, out of our capital, out of our knowledge. Ideally, a farmer using fertilizer can get more ears of corn per acre of land than they could not using fertilizer, right? That's improvement in productivity. That's how the farmer can make more money. You, as individuals, to get a pay raise. What justifies you asking your boss to give you more money now than they were giving you last year? Because you can, bless you, because you can do more now than you could last year. Because you've got more knowledge, you've got more experience, you've got more education. So you can do more. You can be a more productive worker because you've been sitting there doing the whole job, whatever, for a year, year and a half, two years. You've got pretty good at it. So you can make more chainsaws an hour, you can cook more burgers an hour, you can assassinate more chickens an hour, whatever it is. So if you can turn out more work per hour, that is the reason why they'll give you a raise. That's kind of the only reason why they'll give you a raise. Productivity is kind of huge as far as spurring the engine on to inflate that metaphorical balloon. If you want to inflate that balloon, the cycle's still happening, but if you want it to get bigger, because we've got to do more. Luckily, that balloon, well, luckily we're not, that balloon is getting bigger anyway because our population is growing. So we've got 3% more workers this year than we did last year. So that's 3% more customers this year than we had last year. So that balloon is already growing. Anyway, 
to put off. Do we have 3% more land this year than we had last year? No. So what do we got to do to keep up and feed the growing population? We've got to get more corn per acre. We've got to get more soybeans per acre. We've got to get more chickens per chicken. Right. Productivity. So when it <coughs> when it comes to looking at those factors of production, you can have capital intensive. What is capital? Land. Tools and equipment. Oh yeah, land labor capital. Capital intensive is tools and equipment. Capital intensive production uses a lot of tools and equipment. Where you can have labor intensive production. What do you think is your primary tool there? People a little bit maybe I think hard, but this in America, we tend to try to solve problems using tools, equipment, and technology. Because we have knowledge, we have education, we have the money to where we can actually do that. So we'll try a technological solution to a problem where there's other parts of the country that maybe they don't have the education, but what do they do have? A bunch of people. The extreme example I use is making t-shirts here in America. How do we make t-shirts here in America? We got one person running a machine about the size of this classroom, cranking out a thousand t-shirts an hour. How do they make t-shirts in a place like Vietnam? They have a thousand people out there with a nimble and thread making one t-shirt an hour. They're making a thousand an hour, we're making a thousand an hour. But we're, if we're using technology, tech tool to do it the way they're using people. This tool to do it. Why are they using people? Because they got a bunch of them. They don't have any other alternative but to work for these few companies that are there because the education level is lower, the amount of finance and equipment and stuff there is lower. So either well, you work for the company, make two dollars an hour, or you can stay home and work for mom and dad and not get paid pay. We talked about that a little bit already. Yeah. So part of you gotta look at what you have to work with. If you have a lot of people laying around, well, what's the point of investing tons of money in a bunch of equipment? If you don't have any workers, well, then you need to be looking at, well, what kind of education do we have for the workers that we do have? What can we do with them? With the available technology out there. So, I kind of touched on this for five minutes ago. Human capital, that's knowledge, skills, and abilities possessed by the workforce. And those of y'all that have a job are part of the workforce. Those of y'all that are planning on getting a job at some point will be part of the workforce. Motivational speech number 35. Would you agree with the statement the more tools you have, the more you can do? Yeah. If you've got a saw, you can cut some stuff. If you've got a saw and a drain pipe, well, you can cut some stuff and you can do some climb. You have a saw, a hammer, and a drain pipe, well, you can do even more. A saw, a hammer, a drain pipe, and a uh, yeah, pipe wrench, too. Uh, a pipe wrench and a rifle, you can do even more still. Right. And a computer, you can do even more. The more you can do, the more valuable you are. So, as employees, as workers, you need to get yourself in a situation where you can do more. If you're looking to get pay raises and that kind of stuff, because I talked about it a couple minutes ago, you need to be doing what you can to improve your productivity. If you can't do any more this year than you could last year, they ain't going to pay you anymore. Okay, so they sit there and they know the economic value of making 10 t-shirts an hour, and then they, they, that's all they can afford to pay for. That's all you make making, and that's your paycheck. But if you make 11, 12, 15 t-shirts an hour, you're bringing, helping them bring in a bunch more money, and that will allow them to pay you more money. But it goes beyond just getting a pay rate. It's job security. The more you can do, the le more likely you are to get a job, and the less likely you are to lose a job. Because if you're McDonald's, you got to let somebody go and you got two people and one of them can only cook french fries, the other one can do french fries, drive food, register, cook the burgers, and sweep the floor. Which one are you keeping? Which one you let go? You're keeping the one that can do all the stuff. You're letting go of the person that 
can't do as much. That was kind of a little bit my thinking when I went. I can't remember. Okay, I went back and took some classes about four years ago in American history. I actually, now I can teach agriculture. I can teach economics. I can teach business. I can teach history. No, business fine. Accounting, voodoo. <laughs> I'm okay with business. <laughs> yes. But we the, the college a couple years ago when budget cuts were hitting and we trim gears trim there, we're trimming everywhere, but we can trim and it got a point we gotta start letting people go. I'm in a fairly solid situation because I'm actually doing work with three people were doing five years ago. But they kind of retired a couple people and I got a bunch of their class too and then when Dixie got promoted to Dean, I ended up taking over the agriculture thing because I could. But if I can only teach one subject and the enrollment gets low for one year. Uh, when I was working, uh, and I'm not trying to pray here, but it, just a couple of real life examples of when I was working at Seco Finance. I had only been with the company for maybe nine months when he went bankrupt. There's a bunch of people that have been there a whole lot longer than me, years, whatever. The company went bankrupt, and I was one of the few people that they kept because I could do more. Because I could, even while in that nine months that I was there, I was working in the compliance department, but then I was willing to help out, and I was doing some other stuff in another department and stuff in another department, so I could kind of do three things, and they knew I had some game. I was one of them that kept about eight of us in Greensboro, and they kept about a dozen people in St. Paul, Minnesota. We shut down the entire company. I'm talking Conceco Finance, you know, they were sponsoring NASCAR race cars. And then we ended up building a mortgage company for General Electric. I was one of the people that was there just because I could do, I wasn't one of them. I was one of the few, we came in that Friday morning and they said, go wait in the conference room. Everybody else, they're going to a town hall meeting where they're told, you know, the desks are getting cleaned out and we'll fly. Where there's, there's just a handful, a handful of sitting in the top of the table. Well, you can do it with me, Josh. That's saving money. Yes. Saving money through that. I'm not going to be stressful. Finally, things you can clean up are mentally stressful. You can clean up. I had like several years ago where every semester I was doing something entirely different. And what? But the more you can do, the more you can do. Y'all be young. How many of you are young? All of you, congratulations. The exceptional star. <laughs> Y'all don't have kids. Right. Exception? So, with the, any of you married in here? Congratulations. Yes. You have a lot less stretch in your life. It would never be easier for you to keep going with your education than it is right now. Some of you, like Haley, you're still living at home, sponging off with the parents and all that. Fantastic. I know they get on you every level last year, but no, it's a choice for long as a girl. Just, even a matter of months can be the difference between financial stability and not. Take the time to metaphorically put more tools in the toolbox. If you're here from now, you're getting ready to graduate from the south side, and you look around and you're like, you know, I'm making the economy's bad, and I can't really find a job, this kind of will take some Instead of going to find some kind of dead-end job somewhere, you just keep going to school. So then two years later, you could be graduating with a master's instead of an uh, associate's. If things are ugly, you go to graduate school. So then you graduate with a master's when the economy finally turns around. That's what I was telling people a few years ago. Get more knowledge, more education, more skills, more stuff you can put in there. When you do get a job, don't be satisfied with this. Do the least you can get away with. Try to learn the other things. When they teach you to cook french fries after two or three weeks of cooking french fries, say, hey, can y'all teach me how to cook the hamburgers? And then a few weeks later, hey, can y'all teach me how to run a register? They will be pleased to hear that. And then once they do the keys of registry, then one day you just dump out the register and talk about you never come back for it. Right? No, no, no. <laughs> but if, if nothing else, when you learn how to cook french fries, you learn how to cook hamburgers, you learn how to do inventory and that kind of stuff, knowledge, it might help you when you decide to open your own restaurant one day. You never know. Or you marry somebody and says, hey, I think we got to start our own restaurant. We've got some ideas. Right. The more you can do, the better off you are. Fill that toolbox as much as you can while you've got the chance, while you've got the business. 
when I went back to graduate school for the history things, I could only take one class at a time. Because I had a job, I had a wife, I had three kids. One class is all I could do. Instead of getting the thing knocked out in less than a year, it would be two and a half years. Something like that. But even so, taking that one class is like maximizing like the time that you did have. Yeah, I mean, it just. I mean, I did, I'm glad that I, because I'm, my ADD is just good that I wasn't taking four thousand classes in a row, just that I have transcripts from Virginia Tech a little less than that, but still, it's never easier than it is right now. Suck it up, even though the instructors, whatever they may get on your last nerve. I, I, every spring, I'm like ready to drop out of time in tech. Every spring, I'm like, I'm ready, this is it, I'm done, I hate this. I, I'm going to drop out. Gonna drop out. Well, then I was working building houses out in the hot sun, working on roofs, putting shingles on the houses, and digging ditches and puttings and all that kind of crap. And work, working for a dude it, on a hot summer day, the, the, the shingles have got fiberglass, they've got tar, and they got the grits on there. On a hot day, that tar it starts melting. So if you're walking on the shingles, your weight is in your feet. I'm gonna start tearing up the shingles. So does the boss say, dude, it's too hot. So what we'll do is we'll just work in the morning, we'll take a break and work, do, do something inside and save for the afternoon, and we'll come back and do more of the roof tomorrow. Yeah. Man stands on the ground with a guard hose, spraying, not us, spraying the roof to cool off the shingles so our feet won't tear them up so we can continue working. Do you want to work for people like that? Education. Just capital intensive, labor intensive. JJ, we're at, I mean, we're putting the trusses on the roofing system. If you don't know what a truss is, it's sort of the rafters and steel and doors and all that stuff all built together. He didn't want to spend the money to get a crane to come in, hook them up, lift a handful of them up, set them up here on the roof. It's it. He's standing. The wall is three and a half inches wide. You're minimum eight, minimum eight feet off the ground. You're standing there while somebody underground is lifting up one end, trying to lift the thing up, and then you got to grab the thing and pull up, up, up until the thing gets uh, tilt the way to, to where you can lay it over to somebody standing on another wall, and then to you slide the thing over and lift it up, set it in a place, try to nail something. And you do the next one. And then you do that. So by the end of the day, you're completely worn out, you're completely ruined, and you can't do anything the next day. You get your back is sore, your arms are sore, and all that kind of stuff. Just because he's trying to save a couple of, save, save from writing down crane rental on the form that the homeowner is saying. But it cost him more than that because of the lack of work that we were able to do the rest of the day. And the next day, because we got so beat up, putting his trusses on in the first place. He was trying to handle problems in labor when a little bit of capital would have gone a long way. And we would have been happier for it. Right. Um, end of motivational speech number 35. So, knowledge and skills that work with the desk can be accumulated. True. So, for you business people, let's take a business 100, business 200, y'all already know this. So. The rest of you, they'll probably already know this too. But the three types of businesses that sole proprietorship. What do you think is going on there? Your own business. Sole. One. Sole. Uh, sole proprietorship, a partnership, or a corporation. I'm keeping it simple. Yeah, there's subject, subject, or S, and all those kind of privileges. Take account of each one of them. Just corporations. As a whole, both proprietorship and partnership. Beautiful thing about self proprietorship. You run your own business, freaking easy to do. You just wake up one morning and say, well, I'm going to start, I don't know, baking wedding cakes out of my house and selling them. I want to start a photography business. I want to start a chicken assassination business. <laughs> it's easy to do, and you got the freedom to do it. And if you start baking, Whatever wedding cakes and they're not selling very well, well then you can start making funeral cakes or you can start making whatever chicken cakes for the heads of the chickens and you can assassinate whatever. Got that freedom to do it. It's fast. 
because you don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops, do a whole bunch of paperwork and that kind of stuff. You just do it. It's what you want to do. So those are pluses. Minuses is limited finances. Matthew, I really have given you, you you've gotten in past so far this month. So Matthew, what kind of business do you want to run? Okay, you want to run a restaurant. So you can start this restaurant business. You're going to go to the bank and say, I want to borrow some money. And the bank is going to ask you what? How much money are you making now? And he's going to say, well, I'm making about $10 an hour or whatever. He ain't going to, they're not going to be able, they're not going to lend him much money. Now, for a restaurant, that's a little bit more, more complicated. Than this, but like growing, Watermelons in your backyard, and the money you make selling the watermelons is going to go where? Into your household checking account, right? So the catch here is there's no difference between you and the business. So it's just your borrowing power is all the borrowing power you have to get money to buy utility equipment, the car hoses, the ovens, the refrigerators, that kind of stuff. Because the bank is only going to lend you money based on what? Your promise to return it. And so it's only Matthew to work with. Matthew has to make all the management decisions. Matthew, he knows how to cook, and he has taken the accounting classes so he knows how to do the math, but he's terrible with people. He hates people. So, but yet he's got to manage his employees, right? So he's got to do the things he's good at. He's stuck doing the things that he's bad at. Unlimited liability. This business is him. He is business. So, one day, he's got the delivery truck for his restaurant. Good on. <laughs> Whose business is it? His. So, whose truck is it? His. So, the truck pops out of gear, rolls down the hill, crashes through the fence, runs over. Amanda's dog. Oh, you don't? You don't? Because he just killed your dog. <laughs> okay. So, the truck pops in, he rolls down, he'll crash the fence, kills Amanda's dog. Amanda, how are you going to react? I'm going to be very sad. And? Sue. Sue. Him. Not the truck. <laughs> Nobody else can sue. She sues him. And she wins, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars for as well, the emotional anguish and stress. She's gotta miss all those days, weeks worth of work and then get the therapist bills because she's gotta go get therapy and all that kind of thing. She's gonna buy five hundred of those dogs now. <laughs> so um so, <laughs> she so Matthew now owes her fifty thousand dollars. Is Matthew's business for this Matthew? Matthew owes her fifty thousand dollars. So maybe Matthew has to sell a truck, sell the restaurant, and sell some of his furniture in his house, and sell his TV in order to cough up the fifty thousand dollars that he needs to pay her back. So he could just about lose everything. Luckily, she only won fifty thousand in that lawsuit. If she won five hundred thousand, he would have had to sell everything, right? Because the business is him. Him is a business. He could stand to lose everything if something goes wrong. That's the one ugly about self well, That's the big ugly when it comes to sole proprietorship. So partnership. Matthew's sitting there saying, yeah, I can't get enough money out of the bank to get all the stuff that I'm really most to open this restaurant. So he looks around and says, Connor, how would you like to go into the restaurant business with me? I'll bring, I'll bring the oven and delivery truck. You bring the tables, chairs, and refrigerator. And we'll split the money 50 50. Sound like winner? And we'll call it what? M and, what kind of restaurant? MC, MC, MC Hammers. Oh MC my God. MC Hammers, yes. So you can set employees to do work there, shoot pants, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So, that partnership could be just that easy. That's what I described. 
and they don't really have to do a whole lot of paperwork. They ought to write it down, but they can write it down on a piece of paper and they've sign it, right? Saying, you bring the refrigerator and truck and I bring the oven and the tables and chairs. We split the rent, we split the profit. It could be just that easy. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it's going to be slightly more complicated, but it doesn't have to be. This allows for management specialization. Matthew can say, well, you know, I'm good at accounting, so let me do that, and you, you seem to be good with people at Congress, so I'll let you take care of the hiring, firing, working, and supervising people. <coughs> Run with me for a few seconds, this will make sense. They are less limited financially. They're still limited, but they ain't as limited. It's like running an NASCAR race 10 miles an hour instead of 5 miles an hour, right? It's still, but in this case, what can happen? Matthew, you can go to the bank to borrow some money, buy tools and equipment if it's needed. Connor can go to the bank to borrow some money, buy some tools and equipment for the business. So they got the borrowing power of two people. But they, okay, bullet point number two is they still only have the borrowing power of two people. So they're still living financially, but it ain't quite as bad. And guess what? That's really the reason why Matthew should look for a partner. Instead of, he's got the idea, he's got the talent, he knows where the menu's going to be, and he knows what, how to cook and what to cook it on. The only reason why he's going to take on a partner and give up half of the profit is because he can't get it started financially where he is at now. His family doesn't believe in him and won't lend him any money. And that rich uncle that he knows that won 273 million in the lottery won't spot him any money. And I who won 273 million dollars in the lottery won't give him any, right? So he's got to take on a partner. That's why partnerships end up happening in generally in order to get the money to start the thing in the first place. But then there's inconsistencies and disagreements that may pop up. And you could say, well, we need to we, we shut this thing down at 9 o'clock at night. Connor might be saying, no, we need to stay open until 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, Matthew may be saying we need to be using fresh beef, and Connor might be saying, no, let's use the same whatever plastic stuff they use in McDonald's. Right. You can have some arguments and inconsistencies there. What happens when one of them dies? Life can get complicated. Technically, legally, when one of the two of them dies, the partnership is over, boom. You have to come up with a new agreement for the business to go along. But here's the problem here. Matthew dies. He's, I don't know, he, he, he's hitchhiking down the street. I don't know, he, something happens. He dies, he gets killed. And so, what, in his will, he leaves his part of the business to his three sons, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. <laughs> Y'all know who Huey, Dewey, and Louie are? There. Donald looks good. <coughs> so, Matthew leaves his share of business to Huey, Dewey, and Louie. So, Huey owns 16% of the business, Louie owns 16% of the business, Dewey owns 16% of the business, Connor owns 50%. So who do you think should be the one calling the shots? Especially because Dewey, he hangs out with Preston all the time, doing drugs and all that kind of stuff, but really doesn't take any interest in the business whatsoever. So when it comes time to have the business board meetings or whatever, it's 50% is Connor's votes, and then it's only 32% is Huey and Louie's votes, because the other 16% is dropping acid. <coughs> so. It gets complicated, but then Connor dies and leaves his share of business to his nine kids. Oh. Asher, Dancer, Francis, Vicks, and Tommy, Keenan, Donner, Bliss, and uh, Rudolph. Right. So suddenly you've got three people that own 16% and nine people that own like four point something percent. Five point something percent. Five point five percent. It gets complicated and so now you got 13 people of different levels of ownership and then whenever they've got to make a decision they've got to bring 13 people to come in and you know like if you get two-thirds of them to show up and try to agree with something right 
you can get complicated. So a lot of times legally you might do it. Connor and Matthew, they know the way their kids are. So Connor and Matthew might just in the partnership agreement in the first place, they stipulate, well, when business, when if one of us dies, the business gets stopped, it's stopped, it is sold, and the money gets split between Connor and Matthew's kids. Or the money gets split between Matthew and Connor's kids. You did a lot of partnership agreements may have that. How do you terminate business as part of the agreement in the first place? Because otherwise it can get complicated in a hurry. Yeah, but but, they, but but you can have that changes in the balance of power that we were just talking about. And I mean, give control to the end. Oh, yeah, you could do the um, Matthew dies, Connor gets the other half of the business, but then he's got to pay Matthew's kids a fair value. But maybe Connor doesn't have that much money because the business has been in business for a couple of months or kind of thing. So maybe he can't afford to do it. So hire a lawyer. But here's the Still unlimited liability because you're still running this out of their household checking account. So, what ends up happening? It's not Matthew struck the rolls down the hill. It's Matthew O'Connor struck the rolls down the hill. It's Matthew O'Connor struck that kills Amanda's dog. So, it is Matthew O'Connor to get sued. All that ended up happening is Amanda now has two targets instead of one for her lawyer to go after. Now maybe hopefully it's gonna turn out to where you know the fifty thousand well Matthew's on the hook to twenty-five of it, Connor's on the hook to twenty-five of it. So Matthew only has to give up the truck and the TV well, instead of losing an entire house, right? But still they can lose their own personal assets if something goes sideways. Or she could take over the business herself, depending. Okay. Okay. And I apologize in advance. Here it is. I know I've only got three minutes, so they give me four. A corporation, this is a separate legal entity. Picture, if you will, I'm sorry, get this image out of your mind before you get it in there. Matthew and Connor have a baby. That baby's name is Restaurant. Just like you and I, when we have kids, our kids get their own social security number. When our kids turn 16 or 18, they're paying their own taxes. When they're 23 years old and they're driving down the road and they start running over people, that's on them. Right? When they buy a house, they've got to make a house payment. When they turn 26, they've got to pay for their own insurance. They're, I'm not responsible for what my old son Josh does anymore. Because he's his own person with his own household. Well, what happens here is they have created a separate being. Set the social security number, which is your tax ID number. The business has its own tax ID number, but it's its own separate entity. So this bouncing baby business can raise money because unlike us humans, the business can partially sell itself. Matthew and Connor can go out and say, we've got this business. We'll sell you 5% of it. So then Matthew has 20 or 47 and a half percent of it. Carter has 47 and a half percent of it. You now have five percent of it. Why are they selling that little chunk of it? They still are maintaining control of the business, but they're getting some of your money to help them buy the tools and equipment that they need. All right. And you get some of the profit from the dust settle. That's why you would get into the business. But they can raise money that way. They can borrow money, go into the bank and that kind of stuff. And the bank just like, when you buy a car, what happens if you don't make car payments? They take the car away. You buy a house, you don't make the house payments, they take the house away. Well, in this case, the business is a collateral on the loan. And so they can take the business away. And they're only going to lend money based on the value of that business kind of thing where there's a blur between what's going on between Matthew, what's Matthew, and what's Matthew's business when he's running it out of his own checking account. So you can have a lot more options for raising money. It's easier to grow because it's easier to get the money. You have limited liability because it's the company's truck that goes down a hill, crashes and bends. Kills Al, uh, Amanda's dog. So Amanda 
sues the company. So the company has to pay them, and if the company goes bankrupt, well, they, the guys lose their ovens and refrigerators, but they don't lose their cars and TVs. Well, they give a percent. Depends on how, how things go down, but their, their houses, their cars, their TVs, their jet skis, none of that stuff is ever riskier because of its limited liability. Continuity is fairly easy. If a commoner decides, I can't take this anymore, I hate it, I'm out of here, he can just simply sell his shares to somebody else and keep on trucking. So, continuity is fairly easy right now. And we'll talk about the negatives when we come in class on Thursday. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's S corp L limited liability. Yes, yeah, I'm not going to get into all of that. That, that, that is detailed. I'm just flying. I want to be incredible here.